ماي أنا جا حصور الجلا أدونك وين يجا هستان فكر قلدا وحصور الجلا واحد بدن اللي يجبيه وحصور الجلا واحد بدن أنا شقق كله اللي رأسه جا شقق كله. Well, he was really the founding father of piracy. Never fishermen just cashed in on the on the free fall. Kepada orang nak dia lift gudi, hatta ini susah bayi eno. Ay, dalam hampir dalam hampir ke Afrika, ada orang tertakkan sekarang susah bayi en, orang Malaysia kalah kali ini madin, orang Jerman kalah kali ini madin. Ini ayu lift gudi bayi ini madin, ayu kau marah terdunia ini happy ini. Kau kau tak faham kau tak? Wardi kau kau tengsi marah tay, ana, ana ayu kau sili yang lain kacir, ana marah tay macam yang kecil ni. Bodi, kalau itu orang susah lah tan manual. Ayo, abah Shah, abah kan ayo arrayi. Anu wahan kami dah merkas. Tetapi idea das kena nugu ayang kami dah. Inu wahan liske aliu. Anu itu hatta merkas ini lagap tamah ini. Anu liske aliu, anu liske kahai. In April of 2013, Muhammad Abdi Hassan, better known as Afweni or Big Mouth in Somali, granted an exclusive interview with journalists at Mogadishu's most high-end hotel. He explained how he organized fishermen in his home region of Mudug to protect Somalia's coastline, the longest in Africa. Chaos had engulfed Somali land and seas after the state collapsed in 1991. When this first started, it, you know, it's absolutely true that uh, Somali waters had were being uh, overfished uh, by international fishing fleets and because Somalia doesn't have a declared exclusive economic zone, um, a lot of international fishing fleets from Europe and Asia felt absolutely free to come in close into the Somali shores um, and, and fish illegally. So in the beginning it was true, there was a lot of overfishing. In the beginning it wasn't like, it wasn't like ransom as such, it was like fines for the fish they had taken. You know, uh, and they will release them almost instantaneously. It was like, then these uh, illegal fishing boats armed themselves against this, you know, Somalia coast guard. And then it's only after they armed themselves that these guys on the Somali side got very ruthless and started, you know, firing back. أنتوا ذي عنان وحي ولي بعنان شيء آد قالئه أو أنسيا بيلي وآد قالئه أو اللي راميرو وآد قالئه أو إكسبانسيف أو اللي بالعكس أي تان أي عنان ما لك وحكوب بحضر الله بيتو من كل الشام بقول بردي حكوب بحضر ها إن أرنك سدا سكوب بلاوي كبعدي نوح بلاوي أو قل بلارن إن ما دام عن ما ملجرين ما دام عن دولة دي شيرين يعني واحد سكب لوضي هو القلب اللارن أني ولا بقى وش قطعه أفويني، a former civil servant، created a model that quickly outgrew the interests of the everyday fisherman. He would soon be known as the founding father of Somali piracy. What do we do uh, about the, the rampant piracy on the high seas? So what, does buying piracy insurance get you? Second skip, second skip. Over two million square miles of ocean. An anarchy and yet a well-organized business of crime. 
What began as an act of desperation by Somali fishermen to defend their waters swiftly evolved into a criminal enterprise. But don't make any mistake, there may have been illegal fishing in Somali waters, but what we have now is a criminal activity that has got nothing to do with fishing whatsoever and is purely a criminal enterprise run by gangsters for profit using horrendous tactics, including killing people and torture. So this has got nothing to do with illegal fishing anymore. It's all about crime. Gangs of fishermen found they could easily capture and board international fishing vessels. In 2003, Afweni began headhunting for pirate trainers in the Puntland region, where piracy had first emerged. He carefully selected pirates to create the most efficient and least expensive team. Afweni recruited across clan lines, a notable feat in a country devastated by clan warfare. Well, he was really the founding father of piracy. Uh, and interestingly, he wasn't a fisherman. Uh, he's picked up this narrative of um, victimization um, that, that Somali pirates will often use to justify their actions. And in some cases, many of, you know, some cases they were, they were fishermen. But as I understand, Afwene was a former civil servant uh, who returned back home to Somalia uh, after spending time abroad because he saw this opportunity. At the age of 24, Canadian Jay Bahadur left home to spend several months living with pirates. It worked out. I mean, I kind of picked, piracy was one of these things where just a night at a bar, uh, after a few beers with a friend, we just got started talking about it. This was way back in uh, late 2008. And the idea, I think, I, we were, and I specifically was gripped by the same romanticism that I think has affected a lot of people about, you know, hearing about modern day pirates. And uh, so, yeah, as you said, I packed my bags and, uh, and uh, went to see what was out there. For all his talk about defending uh, Somali waters from illegal fishing ships, uh, he's, he began his career by hijacking uh, world food program transports that were bringing food aid to, to Mogadishu, to, you know, to his own people. Um, so quite the opposite of, of stealing fish. They were in fact bringing, bringing grain to, um, to feed the starving population. My he sort of invented the, the kidnapping for ransom model. Um, you, you, you saw, certainly saw pirate attacks before Afwene's time, but they tended to take the form of kind of muggings at sea where uh, the crew might be attacked, their stuff stolen, um, and then the pirates would leave. Uh, Afwene realized that uh, in Somalia with the uh, unsecured coastline, with the, with the security situation there, you could actually grab and hold the crew for a long period of time and uh, in, in, in effect handle it like any other, other, other sort of kidnapping. Mohamed Ado is a Kenyan Somali journalist with Al Jazeera who has covered piracy for nearly a decade. From my interviews with pirates who were involved in the crime, uh, and particularly in El, they told me, first of all, they don't value the ship. The ship doesn't matter to them at all because what will they do with it? Will they take it, you know, and, 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 and what will they do with it? They can take it to any international port. Will they value uh, the hostages? If the hostages are from the countries like the United States, the United Kingdom, France, all these countries that are considered the rich Western countries, that's what they love, that's, that's what they prefer. Pirate groups such as Afuenis were split into two teams, one to attack the ship and the other to hold the ship and its crew after the hijacking. Ransom payments became the main source of revenue for Afweni and his fellow pirate leaders. 
A World Bank report on Somali pirates estimated ransom payments totaled between $339 million and $413 million from 2005 to 2012. I've been a soldier, or I was a soldier for 37 years, and I, I, I guess I've seen some pretty horrendous things, but having to deal with these poor families is heartbreaking. John Steed, a retired colonel who once headed the United Nations Counter Piracy Unit, now runs a hostage support program. When you, uh, when you talk to the pirates, by and large, you're, you're talking to a translator or a negotiator, uh, and his job is to, his job is to negotiate a ransom. You're not talking to the actual pirates holding, holding the hostages by and large. You know, you're talking to a, a go-between who can be extremely polite and um, usually speaks the la they're, they're very good at finding people who speak the language of that particular group of hostages. You know, even if it's Thai or, uh, or, or Chinese, um, they manage to produce negotiators from the Somali diaspora around the world. These negotiators aren't necessarily always in Somalia. They can be anywhere in the world. Um, this is a very complex business model with tentacles that, you know, that, are, that are worldwide. Chirag Bahri was an Indian engineer on a vessel hijacked by pirates in May of 2010. Every evening we used to think about that, whether I'll be able to see the sun in tomorrow morning because the kind of torches what we had on my vessel was enormous. It was so difficult to survive in those conditions that we even lost the hope of, of coming back home or seeing our family members again in the future. So we lost all the hopes. Crew members from poor countries accounted for a majority of hostages. Often abandoned by the ship owner and their governments, some spent years in captivity. Pirates demanded millions in ransom, an impossible amount for the families of the seamen. Chirag's family had little information and had almost no hope for his release. It was disastrous, you can say. They didn't know what to do, whom to approach. My mother was very bad for her. She was under total depression and uh, I lost her during that time. After eight long months living in horrendous conditions, Bahri's shipping company finally paid the ransom and he returned to India. 2008 was a boom year for the Somali pirates. In September, Afweni orchestrated the taking of the MV Faina, a Ukrainian arms ship carrying 33 tanks, grenade launchers and ammunition. 21 crew members were taken hostage. The Ukrainian first mate died from hypertension a few days after the hijacking. Fearing the arms could fall into the hands of Islamist insurgents, an international naval force tried to recover the ship. After five months, Afweni's gang released the ship, its crew and cargo for a ransom payment of $3.2 million. And now we're going to get an update on the pirates of Somalia, in particular what they're doing with all that ransom money. Pirates collected millions of dollars in ransom money, fueling endless speculation of where it all went. Media traced the money trail to Somali communities living in neighboring Kenya, in particular to the Nairobi suburb of Eastleigh. Business is booming here. Yeah, I was born and raised in here, Eastleigh. Well, before it was just, you know, mud, dirt and, 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 and homes and, you know, it was very low life kind of living. But now, as you see, there are many constructions going on now. New buildings are being built, new roads. But residents of Isli, many of whom are Somalis born in Kenya, feel the media unfairly painted Isli as a pirate haven. This is hard work money, hard earned, and uh, we work hard for our living. You know, the people, the pirates who have stole this much, these billions of dollars, they haven't even used that money to help their own people, their own family, their own... They've used that money in other things. We don't know where that money has gone. 
you can obviously see it hasn't done anything to help us. So that money hasn't come to Sli, Kenya, Somalia, or anywhere like that. So that piracy money, I don't know where it's gone, but uh, it hasn't come to us. I ended up in Eastley and um, did some at least cursory investigative reporting on it, talked to some businessmen, talked to some uh, guys funding construction projects there. And of course there are rumors and um, there's no doubt that some pirate money comes uh, from Somalia to the Somali com community living in Eastley. But that money is not going to affect um, property prices in Nairobi in any significant way. So where did all of the money go? If you look at it, it's millions. The piracy money, the ransom being paid out is millions. But when you look at it critically, and having spoken to some of these people who have been holding you know, ships for months, some of them a year or even two, it's not much when you look at how they divvy the money up. For example, they take a ship, they hold it for nine, ten months, and they're given two million dollars. This is how they divide it. Fifty percent of the money goes to the, 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 the financier. Then fifty percent has to be um, shared among the people who first got the ship. As the financier, Afweni's earnings were reinvested in new pirate attacks. Running a pirate gang also involved heavy operating costs. In addition to taking care of hostages, some of whom were kept for years, Afweni had to support his pirates and their habits. These pirates are drug addicts. They chew cut, they drink alcohol for 10 months or a year. They have to get their supply of these much needed supplies so to get them going. Cut a leafy narcotic popular in the Horn of Africa, became an indispensable part of the Somali's pirate life. When you have pirates who are sitting on the ship all day, nothing to do, um, it's the job of their leader just to supply them with cot, literally, you know, 24 hours a day if they want it. Um, and then you get situations where they're so jacked up on, on the drug that um, they, they fire off guns, they, they intimidate hostages. In one case, um, a pirate in the middle of the night on the ship that I was, you know, the, the, a case I was following, uh, simply put a gun to the captain's head because he was so high and said, I want to, you know, I want to leave, I want to go on a, a cruise. And basically just took the ship six hours down the coast and turned it around for no apparent reason. It's not that every month, you know, five or six ships pay their ransom money. No, maybe one would pay their ransom money every month. Now, if you look at all the people who are waiting for this money, it doesn't amount to much at the end of the day. And especially these people who have to build houses, who have to pay off all those women, the ones supplying the cart, the ones supplying the food. They have to give charity. I mean, and, 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 and they talk of, uh, some of them were talking to me about giving money to the weak members of the society. They go to the crippled people and pay. Like, they're like the Robin Hoods of today and Robin Hoods of, of, of Somalia. Eventually, the costs of piracy began to outweigh the reward. International naval forces began patrolling Somalia's seas, and most shipping vessels hired private security to fend against pirate attacks. As the business model of Somali piracy became unsustainable, shrewd entrepreneurs such as Afweni began to scale back their operations. And Big Mouth also started looking out for his own legal safety. He was asking for official forgiveness from the local and national governments in Somalia. Former governor of the pirate-filled region of Himan and Heb, Mohamed Tiai, 
himself accused of benefiting from the spoils of piracy, pardoned Afueni in 2010. Two years later, the internationally backed government in Mogadishu also excused Afueni. To earn the government pardon, he claimed to now be fighting the very crime ring he helped to create. One of Somalia's best-known pirates has announced he's retiring. Mohamed Abdi Hassan, nicknamed Big Mouth, says he will now work with the Somali government to end what he calls a dirty business. Big Mouth's career spanned eight years, and his organization included hundreds of young men. Big Mouth found a way for the government to pay his bills. It's sort of like using a, a bank robber to, to guard the vault, I guess. And uh, this created a huge scandal, of course, last year when it was revealed that Sheikh Sharif had appointed this pretty much the biggest pirate in history, uh, at least in Somali piracy history, as now a counter piracy officer. This idea that 900 and something pirates are demobilized. I think this gives an incorrect image, which is that there are sort of pirate standing armies. Like 900 of these guys are wearing uniforms that say, I'm a pirate, and then Fwene comes along and says, no, 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 you're a soldier now, or you're an anti-pirate uh, militiaman, or whatever it is. In fact, piracy has always worked as very loose confederations of unemployed guys with guns, young men with guns, who come together for the purpose of forming a gang and then dissolve. There's not really a, a, a standing career as, as a pirate. Experts doubted Afweni's sudden change of heart. I've been doing this for nearly six years, so from the, from the very beginning of the sort of the, the peak of the piracy problem, I've had no personal contact with Afweni whatsoever. Um, he has never attended any of the counter piracy meetings that we've held, and uh, I run the secretariat for the Somali contact group uh, for counter piracy. Um, but he has never actually attended any, any, any meetings that I know of. All through this whole piracy thing, they've, you know, they've responded and changed the model as we've reacted. And you know, now the model's coming to an end, then um, you know, they, um, you know, they, they'll adapt, maybe move into something else. As the profits of piracy diminished, Afweni and his colleagues began expanding into other maritime work. Now what you hear, uh, at least according to the UN Monitoring Group, is that uh, pirates now, pirate networks in northern, in northern Somalia and Puntland have converted to weapon smuggling from Yemen because a lot of the weapons coming into Somalia come through Yemen and then northern Somalia. 
So yeah, as you say, it's an extremely adaptable, um, adaptable career. There's a wide range of, of options once you once you know your way around a boat, uh, especially you know in Somalia. New career paths for former pirates included arms running, drug smuggling, human trafficking, and counter piracy. I think Afwene uh, is a good salesman. He has been in the game for a long time, made money, and suddenly announced through a press conference in which both the local and international media attended that he was retiring from what he had been doing, piracy. But again, um, I think he is not done with piracy because he's coming again through the back door saying he's rehabilitating pirates and looking for contracts and all kinds of things. So I think he's just, uh, how can I call it, uh, he, he's just trying to um, change because right now, you know, the, the, the piracy is almost unsustainable. While many were looking skeptically at his apparent retirement, Big Mouth was feeling complacent with his pardon in his briefcase and lived a comfortable life in Mogadishu. I don't know how much money he has, but he still has money. And, and, and he, 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 according to um, friends I've been talking to, and uh, when I met him, he looked like somebody who was enjoying himself in Mogadishu, sitting in cafes, uh, chatting and sipping coffee all day on end. But after being pardoned at home, could he be arrested outside of Somalia? Absolutely. He's committed crimes around, uh, that are punishable by international law. Belgian authorities have detained suspected leading Somali pirate Mohamed... He was detained Abdi at Brussels Abdi airport Abdi along with another man when he arrived, believing he was to be interviewed for a documentary about his life story. Guilty of everything he may be accused of, but that will be tested in court. Any documentary could be many, many years away. Having an official government pardon, Afweni was a free man in Somalia. But the United Nations linked him to dozens of hijackings, charges he would have to face if caught traveling abroad. In October 2013, nearly a decade after his career as a pirate began, and despite his quest for redemption, Undercover Belgium agents arrested Afweni in an elaborate sting operation. Posing as filmmakers, they convinced Afweni to fly to Brussels to be interviewed for a documentary on piracy. Upon landing, Afweni was immediately arrested and taken to prison in Bruges. He faced up to 45 years in prison for hijacking a Belgium ship in 2009 and kidnapping the crew. Perhaps for the first time in his career, Big Mouth had been outwitted. and <laughs> Kaila dini uruya 